Welcome to my presentation, Message Denial and Alteration on IEEE 802.15.4 Low Power Radio Networks. This presentation was originally for a paper presented at the 4th IFIP International Conference on New Technologies, Mobilities, and Securities in Paris, France. This presentation discusses the susceptibility of IEEE 802.15.4 radio networks to several different attacks. The attacks are based around a denial of service branch out and show how to use denial of service as part of larger attacks, for example, man in the middle. The attacks themselves are not unique, um, rather they are designed to demonstrate some basic building blocks. This paper, and the presentation you're watching, is aimed at security researchers who need to know what attacks are physically capable on these networks. In this way it's hoped it moves many of the published papers detailing um, hypothetical attacks and moves them into a real-world application where it can be shown these attacks need to be considered when designing a network. I'll start with a quick background of the 802.15.4 wireless networks in case you're not familiar with them. From there I'll move on to attack hardware and its capabilities before showing its actual attacks and the results of those attacks. The countermeasure section and the transmit power consideration section of this paper are not covered in as much detail, so I encourage you to refer to the paper if you're interested in it for more information. IEEE 802.15.4 is a wireless standard for low-rate wireless personal area networks. Um, it runs on many different frequency bands, but the most popular, and the one that all of these slides are based on, is the 2.4 gigahertz band. On this band, it runs at 250 kilobits per second, and the range can vary from anywhere about 10 to 400 or more meters. And it uses 16 channels. So 802.15.4 is used as a lower layer by several other protocols and standards and organizations. The most prevalent that you might have heard of is Zigbee, but there's lots of other people using it as well. It's also used in a lot of proprietary protocols and um, commercial devices that you might not, not have otherwise heard of. So the kind of markets you'd expect to find it in would be stuff like home automation, smart energy, security systems, remote control, and medical devices. Really, it's a lot of small, cheap nodes that need to talk over not that big a range. This is the 802.15.4 data frame as transmitted over the air. Um, the numbers to the right indicate the byte, so the first one starts there, and the preamble in red at the top is byte number one. Each byte takes 32 microseconds to transmit. This is at the 250 kilobit per second rate. Um, so you can see it starts with six bytes of basically the preamble and starter frame delimiter. Um, so these are how the radio synchronizes to the frame itself. So the six byte is the phi header it's called, which is actually how many bytes are to follow. So this lets the radio know how long it should be on for and receive. Um, so then you have the payload itself, followed by a frame check sequence, which is used to ensure no corruption occurred. The attack hardware uses two radios. One is always in receive mode, one is always ready to transmit. Um, this is used because it takes time for the radio to switch from receive to transmit. So each of the two radios could actually be used, for instance, both in receive or both in transmit. Um, but if you only have a single radio, it has to spend time first receiving the frame, deciding what to do, and then switching to transmit mode. So this results in a much quicker response by having two. This is the actual attack card where it was realized. Um, it just uses two commercial available 802.15.4 kits. Uh, the specific ones chosen here have AVR microcontrollers and an Atmel radio on it. But again, you could use any 802.15.4 board. This is just showing that the hardware is available for purchase. Here these boards are about 40 euros each. Now the easiest and the dumbest attack is a wideband type of attack. Um, so this is known as pulse jamming and this is where the transmitting radio just transmits pulses of information. The idea is that it will disrupt any traffic on the frequency that the radio is tuned to. Now there is 16 channels in the 15.4 spectrum so to jam everything, the radio would need to jump every channel. So jump to a channel, transmit a pulse of energy. Jump to the next one, transmit. Um, and the speed you can do this at basically means that any message longer than 50 octets will be disrupted, because um, any message longer than that is essentially guaranteed to have some interfering transmission occur from the attacker. 
Now this is extremely easy to detect and track down as you have a transmitter always going and it disrupts everything on this same frequency, especially Wi-Fi, for example. So again, it's extremely obvious you're doing this because everyone's um, frequency band just kind of dies. A smarter attack is just to wait for the 802.15.4 traffic and then transmit your jamming. Um, this avoids disrupting all the other users of the same frequency. So this is a timing diagram showing this jamming occurring. The target node starts transmitting at the beginning at 0 microseconds. Um, at 229 microseconds, the jamming node detects the transmission. And it takes a little bit longer, so you can see by 246 microseconds, the jamming node's transmission is actually on the air and will begin disrupting the target node. Um, it only jams for a very short period of time. It's about 6 bytes of uh, the 15.4 frame will be jammed before it drops off. The idea of this is it eliminates interference to other users, um, which could be happening after the target node's transmitting, and it also makes detection slightly more complicated. This shows the transmission of six 802.15.4 beacon requests. Um, they go left to right on the page and each one then goes down. So you can see the first three have the yellow lightning bolt beside them, and this means they've been transmitted without any, any interfere present. Um, all the bytes are green, indicating the received byte is the same as the transmitted byte. Now the next three have the attacker enabled, and you can see basically there's six bytes in the middle that turn red because the received data is different from what was transmitted. Uh, you'll notice it's only the sixth there. The frame check sequence is actually what was transmitted. Of course, this will be invalid when the receiver calculates the frame check sequence. Um, it's expecting to come up with those same values. Because there's been corruption, it'll assume this packet is no good and discard it. So the main objective of these disruption is just to cause the receiver to discard the message. So an even smarter way of doing this is to just jam the two bytes at the end, that frame check sequence. This way, the receiver will always discard the message because the frame check sequence is invalid. However, the attacker has access to the information in the message since it actually hasn't corrupted any of the payload data. Um, when you look at the 15.4 frame as it goes over the air, again you'll see those first five bytes is the preamble and start of frame delimitator to synchronize the radio. The next byte is actually the length of the following phi payload. Um, so what this means is as soon as the attacker receives this phi header that tells it the total length, it knows right away when the frame check sequence relative to this byte will be transmitted over the air. So it can time the transmission to occur and only jam the frame check sequence. So here's an example of the message specific denial. The attacker transmits only at the very end of the message causing the intended receiver to discard it, but the attacker still sees the entire payload. Now this shows a generic 802.15.4 network running. Uh, it's set up to transmit random lengths of data from one node to the other. So you can see this is a trace in Wireshark of an over-the-air sniffer. The length field is random in length there. You can see you see messages 29 octets long, 119, 117, 60. Um, the data is just an incrementing number. It starts at 41, and you can see it goes up to 9E at the end. The two highlighted bytes at the very end of the message, in this one, they're C3A8, or the frame check sequence. And you can see halfway in the screenshot there, Wireshark has said the FCS is correct. It's what's intended. Now the same network um, is restarted and the same messages are exchanged, except this time the frame check sequence jammer is enabled. So you'll note the data is completely valid. It starts in at 41 again and ends at 9E again. However, the FCS is just 5555, and he's, you can see Wireshark is expecting what was transmitted before and marks this as a bad FCS. And you'll see actually every message has this bad FCS, even though they're at different lengths. So it's dynamically calculating where the FCS is for every message and jamming just that part of the message. So rather than jamming every single message by just disrupting the FCS, you can do even better than that. The first few bytes of the phi header are the addressing information, um, the auxiliary security header, which tells you if the message is encrypted or not, and there's also a frame control field, which tells you what type of message this is. Is it a data message, beacon, beacon request? Is it an acknowledgement to say the previous message was received okay? So 
you can receive this message in real time and start decoding it as it's being received. Um, once you decode it, you can decide, is this a type of message I want to jam? For example, is this message addressed to a specific node that I'm trying to knock off the air? And if it does, is, then I'll jam it with the frame check sequence jammer. So here's an example of a simple man in the middle attack. The packet from Alice to Bob will be jammed because the attacker in the middle is analyzing it as it's being transmitted and sees that the address is destined to Bob. So it jams the frame check sequence, causing Bob to discard it. Alice will be expecting an acknowledgement, otherwise it'll keep retrying sending the message. So in this case, the attacker sends a spoof fake 802.15.4 acknowledgement back to Alice. At this point, it can modify the packet as it needs, as it's received all of the payload data. It then sends this onward to Bob. Depending on how it's modified, Bob may send back a 15.4 acknowledgement, so it might be required to jam this message. So bootstrapping is what happens when a node joins a network. So this type of attack isn't really a specific cryptographic attack, but more of a management problem. So let's take an example of bootstrapping. You have a wireless remote control, and at some point you want to tell your DVD player that it should listen to this remote. So you might use something like you press a button on each device, and it does some join method. As these are quite low power devices, you might just use an unsecure join message where you transmit in clear text whatever in security or encryption data you need. The idea being it's extremely unlikely an attacker will be listening at that exact instant you perform the bootstrapping. Um, so let's look at how this works with the attacks presented here. So in this case, the network does start up fine, there's no attacker present. So the devices start communicating with encrypted traffic. An attacker enters the area, but it cannot snoop the data since it cannot decrypt any of the information. So 802.15.4 encryption only covers the MAC payload. The addressing information is not encrypted. This is understandable when you consider that if it was encrypted, every single packet would have to be received entirely by every radio chip before it's decrypted and checked against if this is addressed to me or not. Um, when you're so concerned about low power as most 802.15.4 devices is, this would be a significant problem. What this means though is that you can still perform the selective denial of service attack against a chosen node, even if you're using encryption. So in this case you could decide that any packet which has a source or destination of the node's address is jammed. You can also look at the auxiliary security header which tells you if encryption is used or not, and then you can jam only encrypted messages. So at this point, the user will see, hey, this node has stopped working. Something's wrong. The node's broken. So it requires some sort of service to get it back working on the network. So the user will either replace the node, or, as in you do with a misbehaving computer, just reset it in an attempt to fix the problem. In either case, um, either the reset or replacing the node will result in the unsecure join traffic being transmitted again. Uh, but at this point, the attackers present, they see that this information is not encrypted, so they do not block it. Um, from the information, perhaps they can receive the network keys and information they need. So if the attacker is designed to not block this unsecured join traffic, and then in fact stop blocking the secure traffic, it'll look like to the user that, while well, they reset this node, and it's communicating again, everything works, problem solved. In reality, what's happened is an attacker has manipulated them to force this event, which was supposed to be very rare and not occur when the attacker is present, to occur when the attacker wanted, and more importantly, when the attacker is present. And they've now let this attacker onto their network. So here's an example of a real protocol that could be broken in this way. This is uh, the Zigbee RF4C is the example I'm using here. However, there is a considerably more amount of protocols available using 802.15.4. Not all of them are published in this way, so you can't actually have uh, the information of how the joining method works. But in RF4CE, uh, it uses a method in which the key isn't sent directly unencrypted over the air, and it, instead it's split up into a number of messages. However, if you observe all the messages, you can acquire the encryption key uh, just by passively listening. Uh, to prove it's not just me misreading the spec, here's a example of a clipping from an app note from Daintree, a popular sniffer manufacturer. Yeah, here it says, the SNA Professional Edition can harvest Zigbee R4C security keys if it is able to observe the entire communication between two devices during which the security key is established. So the point is that RF 
for CE. 